Hello, Bible readers. Weeping may linger in the night, but joy comes in the morning. This is the idea that that which is worthy of lament is temporary, while that which is worthy of our gratitude, of our praise, of our thanksgiving is forever. The godfather of all modern psalms studies, at least in how he is regarded by Brueggemann and Bellinger in their commentary, is Klaus Westermann. Great name for a German theologian. Westermann calls psalms like Psalm 30 a narrative psalm because they tell the entire narrative, the entire drama of faith that is faith from human need and then human petition through God's rescue, finally to human gratitude for that rescue. The drama of faith is like the plot of a mystery movie or how a novel typically moves. Like, remember studying all that in English class way back when where there was plot and plot development, and then there was eventually a climax, and then a resolution, that kind of thing. Well, faith is a narrative unto itself that has components like this. It's a, it's a relationship unto itself. It's a relationship like marriage is the description of a relationship. But faith is a peculiar kind of relationship, like marriage, and faith has its own kind of plot, ingredients, things that make it faith. A marriage could be boiled down to plot points, you could say, of falling in love, making vows to each other, being in love, keeping vows to each other. It could be, you know, scrunched into just those four ideas. Faith is a relationship with God that Westerman would say is a human in need, and then the human begs for God's help, petition. Then God rescues, which brings about human gratitude. So that's the, the general, just four words that make up the narrative of faith. Need, petition, rescue, gratitude. Psalm 30 is able to talk about not only those four pieces, but also the before of need. So kind of the what's life like before the narrative of faith. And it's also able to talk about the after gratitude part of this faith relationship. And at the very center of this psalm and at the very center of the narrative of faith is the miracle of God's intervention, uh, God's rescue, you could say. So you look at verses 6 to 12, and you'll see what I mean. Uh, 6 to 7a, the first half of verse 7, are like, my life was completely stable. It was all good. By your favor, you had established me as a strong mountain. Before you hid your face, and I was dismayed. There's an abrupt change in the strong mountain language, right? And then starts the need, petition, rescue, gratitude cycle. The petition in Psalm 30 is especially memorable. The psalmist doesn't just ask for help. To motivate God, like to try to get God to do what the psalmist wants God to do, which we have seen in other psalms where the psalmist will suggest some things to hopefully motivate God to be the God that God is. But here in Psalm 30, the psalmist is like, and you know, if I go down to the pit, what's the dust going to praise you? Is it going to tell of your faithfulness? Be gracious to me then. <laughs> when I read that, it's like, how vain or self-interested does the psalmist think God is? You know, as though God just lives for someone to praise him. Brueggemann says this level of boldness, <laughs> this kind of cheekiness in the midst of lament borders on blasphemy, but he says this kind of dark humor, it's also so very real, isn't it? Have you ever said something or at least thought something in the midst of grief or kind of angry sadness that is pretty clearly inappropriate? <laughs> something you maybe wouldn't say out loud to anyone, or if you do say it out loud, 
it's to someone you trust. Dark humor is a human way to cope sometimes, to unburden our imaginations. Well, here in Psalm 30, the psalmist just lets it out to God. <laughs> it is, again, a level of candor, vulnerability that shows how intimate we can be in prayer with God. There's nothing held back here. We do not have to watch our every word or thought, wondering if we're pleasing the Almighty One who could smite us down whenever He chooses. No, in, in our desperation, especially in our desperation, we can share these kinds of kind of kind of thoughtless just not not terribly meaningful desperate throwaway lines save me i mean if you don't what's the dirt gonna love you like i do please one last word about the final piece of the four-part faith narrative cycle i've talked about need petition rescue gratitude Karl Barth was a 20th century theologian who said that gratitude is the key practice for a human life. As gratitude is the only response we can really have to the grace of God. When he looked at the big picture of who God is and what God does, of who humans are and what humans can do, he basically says that what makes a human a human is their ability to see God's grace as grace and notice that God's grace has been given to us. And so to be human as we notice and receive God's grace means we are then moved to thank God for this undeserved love. So he'd go on to say that only humans can thank God Although we can't know what God's relationship is like with all non-human creatures, we do not know of any other creature that praises or give, gives thanks to God. So it is actually the human vocation. It is our happy task, you could say, our job to be grateful to God. The dirt can't do it. The dirt won't do it. It's up to us. Last thing he suggests is that when we turn away from gratitude toward God, we turn away from who we really are, what we are called to do, who we're called to be, and we become something less. So getting stuck in anything but gratitude, shame, need, fear, getting stuck in the, the weeping that lingers in the night, if you will, that's how humans become something less than what God gifts us to be, human beings who always remember that joy does come in the morning. I am one with my God. My God is with us, all of us, at all times and in all places.